wherever you go, whether it is a small single or single uh, doctor owned thing or a corporate uh, IVF uh, centers, it's the same thing. The protocols are so set, but there is scope for so much of unethical practice in this. So, and you know, it all depends on your own conscience, the person who is dealing with it. So that had to be taken under control. And that's why this act is that. Actually, now we feel that it has been forced on us, but then it is important, you know. Uh, what about the selection criteria in I mean, earlier you used to match the physical aspects to uh, for the parent, uh, for the children, so that they match the uh, physical characteristics of the parents. Is that process still there? I mean, it, we can't just give a riffraff to anybody. You know, you can't do it. It's not. It's not fair. So, all of us who are sensitive to the whole process, and I would say have been ethical. You know, we like to select the donor. Uh, we look at the face of the woman. You know, her appearance basically. Because the, uh, it, the man is in any case going to have his sperms over there, so therefore the genetics has to be matched. Not the genetics, but at least the physical appearance will be matching with the lady. Hello and welcome to Fertility Tales powered by Nova IVF, the podcast that brings hope, insights and clarity to your fertility journey. I'm your host Simrat and in today's episode, we delve into a topic that touches many lives but is enveloped in layers of legalities and emotional intricacies, the Assisted, assisted Reproductive Technology Law. Joining us to unravel these layers is a luminary in the field of infertility in India, Chief Clinical Mentor for Nova IVF Fertility and Chief Consultant at Nova IVF Delhi, Dr. Sonia Malik. Dr. Malik's profound contributions to the reproductive medicine have not only pioneered advancements in the field, but have also lit the path for countless individuals dreaming of parenthood. With an illustrious career spanning across three decades and expertise that has guided over 10,000 ART cycles, Dr. Malik's insights today are invaluable. Dr. Malik, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much, Simrat. It's been lovely to watch you all, you know, all through these fertility tales that we've Thank been Thank you so much, for Doctor. So long. Thank you. Let's start at the very beginning. How did you start to specialize in the field of infertility, in India especially? It's interesting because, you see... Uh, in the year 1976, I go back to 1976, that is the time that the first baby was also born, you know. So basically what happened was my thesis was on infertility. My, my uh, guide gave me this thesis on infertility and that's what awakened the interest in infertility, I would say. Then I set up the first infertility clinic in my medical college and then from there on my journey started. Then you see, uh, I went to the Middle East, I practiced there and there also in Basra Medical College, they didn't have a proper infertility setup. So I set up the infertility clinic there. Those days, infertility clinic, if you fill up the forms and you just do whatever you can, there was hardly any medicine, no ultrasound, no nothing. So it was a very basic kind of a thing that we had. But then it kept on, you know, I kept on uh, having this interest and it grew. So eventually when I came back, I got this opportunity to get into this IVF practice because somebody was starting an IVF clinic, you know. So I just, you know, sort of joined hands with her and we started off. And infertility, I mean, as a subject must have been a very uh, big aspect to cover way back then also. And having practiced in Middle East, do you think there's a certain taboo that is there even in the Middle East or is it tremendous, something that is in tremendous. India? Tremendous. You see, I worked in Basra. Basra was uh, kind of a mixed population. They have Muslims as well as Christians over there. They were modern. Right. But yet, that, you know, uh, the, the population in those countries is not as much as us in India. Similarly, in Saudi Arabia, where I practiced later on, that is the heart of uh, Islam. And there again, even though Islam promotes four marriages amongst the, you know, the men can marry four times, still infertility was a very big taboo. The moment a woman was declared as infertile, mm -hmm. the man would get married again, you know, it was like that. So basically there was a lot of trauma, a lot of problems around infertility, even in that country. It's where it, it's, see, what has happened is infertility is more of a social cause. Right. Even for us, it's a, such a populous country. Now, of course, the fertility rate is index is indicating that is, it is declining. But still, we have, a far, we have far to go. But still, our women are suffering. Our men are suffering too now because it has come out in the open. There's more awareness about male infertility as well. Right. So therefore, uh, I think it's more socio, social problem rather than anything else. With the declining fertility, 
may become an economic problem also. As at present, it is more of a social problem for us. The acceptance of infertility as a disease that it is, it has to be taken as any other disease which can be treated has, is that mental block has to come about with people to you understand said, that. You said the word disease so spontaneously. Yeah. And the government does not agree to call it a disease. It is, that is the biggest problem because basically the moment you call it as a non-infectious disease, you know, and it covers. So then they have to cover for it, you know, in the, the so right. insurance comes in, so many things can happen. So they are still debating about it. But this new thing about the decreasing fertility index worldwide, mm -hmm. WHO has also declared it, you know. Mm -hmm. So for that reason, what it is, a, it is actually very, very good and hopeful for the infertile couples because basically we know now that the government will take some action for these people as well because, you know, it is becoming a social... It's a rampant... It's a, it's a huge uh, it's problem a, now. It's a rampant problem now. It's a rampant problem. Okay. Um, thank you, Doctor, for your insight with this. But um, delving to the topic that we are here to discuss today, the ART um, law, how do you think the industry of the infertility industry has evolved in India? What has, how has the landscape changed a little bit from the time that you've been practicing to the time that legislation has come about in uh, the form of ART law? It's been a long journey. But uh, what happened initially was it was we started as a science. I would say, and it was treated as any other any other uh, speciality uh, in the medical in, in uh, fraternity, you know. Right. And then gradually, what happened was that once we started having IVF, IVF was actually started in the private sector. Mm -hmm. So the private sector boomed, and when it was basically it it wasn't there in the public sector, the medical colleges and hospitals did not offer it. So it started to become an industry. You know, that is the gradual change because obviously economics comes in, business comes in when you're having something in the private sector. Right. That's how it, it, it uh, has, you know, sort of uh, increased in because of the growing demand and because of the growing awareness, more and more clinics started mushrooming. People who, are, who were not even trained had started their own businesses. businesses. And I, like you said, the industry boomed. So with the coming in of so many players, you know, there was a lot of problem with the ethics, with the kind of uh, uh, treatment that was beated out to these couples, you know, all that. And so eventually the government had to take some action and hence this act has come in. We actually welcomed this act because it will bring some amount of, you know, uh, some amount of control. And structure. And structure yeah. as well to the whole mm -hmm. issue. Although uh, as far as we are concerned, it is a very structured kind of a <laughs> program wherever you go whether it is a small single single uh, doctor owned thing or a corporate uh, ivf play, uh, centers it's the same thing the protocols are so set but there is scope for so much of unethical practice in this so and you know it all depends on your own conscience the person who is dealing with it so that had to be taken under control and that's why this act is that actually now we feel that it has been forced on us mm -hmm. but then it is important you know but i think the player uh, the uh, the corporates or the brands which have been following ethical practices do not have to worry about it because the legislation is there as a watchdog, but uh, your we're practices already doing do, that. We're already, yeah. uh, do guide you to absolutely, the right thing. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, doctor, now the ART law is in uh, place. So can you elaborate on this, legis what this legislation entails for the couple? Uh, we do have the people who are managing the show, but also what it means for a couple. For the patient. For the patient, for the couple. So basically, we have to look at two kinds of things, two kinds of people. One who are capable have, of having their own child through their own gametes. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is what is generally, what happens to couples, you know, you have your own child. But then there are, mm -hmm. us, there are some people who cannot have their child because there's something wrong either with their gametes, which means the egg or the sperm, mm -hmm or something is wrong with the uterus. So that's a third party reproduction. They require third party. When you say third party, sorry, you yeah. mean a donor? A donor right. or a surrogate. Or a surrogate. Donor can be a male donor or a female donor. You know, if it is requiring a sperm or an egg, or it could be a uterus, so it has to be a surrogate. So that's third party. So there is a huge segment of people who require third party reproduction in the country because of various, the biggest issue is infections. Vaginal, I would say reproductive tract infections. So that, especially in the hinterland, especially in the villages, you know, where they are not very con conscious about hygiene, etc. Mm -hmm. So there, so therefore, that segment is huge, you know, also. Mm -hmm. 
since this this was and most of the unethical practice that was happening was in this particular segment of third party reproduction so that's why this bill actually spells out the kind of control that you require for your own for your own uh, for making your own baby or using a third party to have a okay. baby so let's go on to the self cycles self okay. cycles first so for all uh, women who have who are undergoing this self cycle or even for the women who would require donor eggs for that matter the government has set an age you know that is between 23 and 50 so a girl who is married at 18 will not undergo any treatment she'll till she becomes 23 okay that's a catch you know because see what hap- what is also happening in the country is that the ovarian reserve is decreasing so they have a very limited time where they can produce their own child through IVF even and after that they may require a donor third party but whatever it is it has been done for the good so between 23 and 50 which is also the age for the donor okay a for the donor it is up to 35 you know where you require an egg donor it is 35 because then she won't have any eggs left mm-hmm. and for the woman who wants to who is going to receive it it's 50 it's okay. 50 for the man the age is going up to 55 Okay. okay so that is the difference between the two and uh, basically that is the first thing the second thing is that they have to be a married couple okay not even a live in relationship it has to be a married couple they have to be actually married even for donors not for the for the donor cycle the recipient has to be married donor can be unmarried we'll come to that but for the recipient she has to be married husband they have to be actually if they are divorced or going through a divorce they cannot go through an ivf because basically then they are not married any longer right 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 and then it is very interesting we'll get get into the nitty gritties of it because in surrogacy they are talking of something else in this they are talking for so let me talk about self cycles first so same sex couples are also not allowed mm-hmm. right single woman is allowed she is allowed to undergo an ivf okay okay living live in relationship is not allowed The, the but the single woman same sex couples are not allowed but a single woman can have a child single man cannot have a child mm-hmm. right so these are the riders over there so these are the categories of people so we can entertain a couple and we can entertain a single woman that's it so the rest of them we cannot entertain for ivf so that is something that people have to understand and there are so many court cases going on at the moment because mm-hmm. people are some people are over the age of 50 they have got their eggs preserved over there say so they don't know what to do with them then there are others who have lost children and they want to go through this so things like that so there are multiple cases because ultimately it's a social problem right right then if we come to third party reproduction like i said the donor has to be younger so it's only up to age 35 for the male it is up to 45 okay if it, it's a male donor but we still want a younger donor we don't want a old donor and for surrogacy also it's basically up to age 35 right if if you are going to choose a surrogate she has to be within that age it cannot be an it cannot be an older woman again we don't want an old woman like that of 50 coming to us for surrogacy because then it's going to be a very high risk pregnancy so therefore 35 okay right so these are the categories of women that we uh, do and then again in a a very interesting thing for surrogacy a single woman who's either divorced or or she's a widow she can undergo surrogacy yeah so the, so that is why the law is has got many many uh, loopholes fallacies and, yeah. and loopholes in it you know for, it's not it's not a straight law and probably they had to take such a huge population into consideration that they faltered somewhere mm. but then that, this is what is happening and therefore you, we have all kinds of muddling up over there you know we we cannot offer it to everybody mm. so that is the that are those are the major things about this law and then of course there are so many permissions that need to be taken both by the company or by the clinic who is going to practice it and to, and by the people who want to go through it not for self cycles there is no permission required from the uh, by the couple but yes if you are going through a third party reproduction there are lots of permissions that have to be given and how does the selection selection process impact the whole process for the donors? donors so now what the government has done well is to create an entity called an art bank okay this is something which is separate from an art clinic we who are going to impart the treatment to the patient is an infertility clinic okay the donor supply 
and you know the the eligibility of the donor is the headache of the ART bank okay similarly ART bank can also be a, can be an egg bank can be a sperm bank and can be a surrogacy bank anything but they have to take those licenses and there is a separate license fee for everything you have to apply to the government the clinic applies you pay a, a license fee of 2 lakhs in a year and that is that is to be renewed every 5 years surrogacy also they pay, pay that much but it, but the art bank pays you know they pay the, sorry the art bank and the surrogacy clinic also pay the same but there are other people who pay less so we'll come to that later on one question here yeah. does this whole process delay the process of ivf absolutely or? yes uh, doctor uh, you've elaborated the art law and the process but uh, could you also test, tell us a little bit about the ART law, the criteria for donors, and also how it impacts the selection process? Uh, well, you know, somewhere they have liberalized it. And uh, somewhere, of course, there's again a rider and a catch. Mm -hmm. So I'll go through both. I told you about the age. Age has to be up to age 35. She can't be beyond that. The better part is that anybody can be a donor, whether she's unmarried or whether she's married. Earlier, we used to, we were ICMR, when the ICMR guidelines were there, we could only do it with married donors with one child, at least having one child. So fertility proven. That was the concept that at least she's fertile because she has a child of her own. But now it can be anybody, an, an unmarried girl or a married girl or a widow. Anybody can be a surrogate, uh, sorry, a donor. So the, there, is no, there is no restriction on that, right? And then the other thing is you have to do a selection and you have to screen them the way you screen your own couples. The same kind of uh, infection screen is done for the donors as well, everything. But the thing is that the donors have to come through the ART clinic, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, ART bank. And the donors have to be altruistic again. You have to have somebody who's either willing to do it without money or she's your relative. So therefore, that confidentiality thing has gone away. They, you don't have to hide the face of the donor and you don't have to say ki, earlier we never used to disclose the donor to the, to the recipient couple. couple. We were not, they were not allowed to see who it was. We would select it for them and then we would do it. So they had to basically depend on our conscience and our discretion. Mm -hmm. But that has gone away now. We are allowed, they are allowed to see the, uh, the donor. And since they can bring their own donor also, it's altruistic. They can bring anybody from their own family to be their donor and we just process it then. So that part is good. But again, it has its own problems. If you have a donor, if you have a known donor, and there is a uh, you know sort of kind of a discord in the family, then they, then the whole thing sort of becomes uh, difficult to manage. I'll give you an example. So there, this is a doctor who came for his daughter, right? And he brought his daughter-in-law as the donor. So he said she's going to do the cup. They came to me, the doctor, uh, the father-in-law and the mother-in-law. They brought both the girls, mm -hmm. the daughter as well as the daughter-in-law. So now, okay, I said, fine, that's absolutely allowed through the law. You are absolutely correct. Everything is fine. And then uh, later on, that daughter-in-law, when I took her for examination inside, she said, ma'am, I don't want to do it. They're forcing me to do it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that kind of a thing will come up because there will be so many families who will force their force their opinion and this was a doctor family imagine mm. but still so then I told her what is your apprehension she said I myself have had a, I had a child through IUI through a, through a procedure and now I am supposed to be doing an IVF for somebody which I don't want to you know and then the whole her husband knows who the donor is you know the oh. you know, so it's a very difficult thing for the whole it's the the family uh, dynamic uh, dynamics changes change, right? you know so that kind of a thing will happen. It will really blow up. The second thing is what I'm looking at is that in case of male donors, you know, it is a very secretive thing, especially for the men. First of all, to be able to accept that they can't have a child of their own is very difficult for the man. It's a male ego it's a male, that. Yeah, it's very traumatic, traumatic. And then if they know that it's, it's somebody from my family, it's even worse, yeah. you know. So that kind of a thing will erupt later on. But as of now, this is what the law says. You can have, an, you have to. So as far as altruistic donors are concerned, what they have kind of said is that you may not give her cash or, sorry, you may not give her money or remuneration for her services, but you can compensate her for the, for the money that she's lost 
uh, for doing this process because she comes to the clinic and she misses work. Mm -hmm. So all that plus the conveyance charges, plus the nutrition and all. So that way they've tried to compensate the donor, which, and then there is an insurance for the donor. In case there is something happens to the donor during the process, mm -hmm. then the couple has to pay for that. So they, they buy a insurance for the donor and God forbid that that is given to her, it is after five years that she gets the money or whatever it is, even if she doesn't, I mean, nothing will happen to her because IVF is a very safe process and we are very careful with donors so that is that is how the donor cycle is surrogacy is even worse i think you should take it up as a separate thing with somebody because it's very elaborate yeah maybe too we'll many take processes it up too many episodes. processes yeah uh, doctor i wanted to on the side uh, you said that the donor cycle the donor process is now altru altruistic uh, what about the selection criteria in i mean earlier you used to match the physical aspects to uh, for the parent uh, for the children so that they match the uh, physical characteristics of the parents. Is that process still there or? At least, I mean, most of the, most of the good centers, I would say, will always do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, we can't just give a riffraff to anybody. You know, you can't do it. It's not, it's not fair. So it's all of us who are sensitive to the whole process, mm -hmm. and I would say have been ethical, you know, mm -hmm. we like to select the donor. Uh, we look at the face of the woman you know, her appearance basically, because uh, it, the man is in any case going to have his sperms over there. So therefore the genetics has to be match, not the genetics, but at least the physical appearance will be matching with the lady. Mm. So we try to match them as much as possible. And, and then um, put them through this selection criteria. We do their testing, hormones, infections, everything, and see whether they are fit to become a donor. Mm. So that process takes about a month, two months to happen because we donors are not very easy to find. Of now. course. It's... The biggest thing I forgot to mention is that a donor is not allowed to donate her eggs more than once in her lifetime. lifetime. Okay. Even for the man, both of them. Okay. So yeah. it's same. Okay. So, so therefore that also is a kind of a restriction because now what is happening is you think the donors will not, will not tell a lie. They would. So every donor, <laughs> so what is happening is they will donate here, then they will go to a third clinic and donate over there. The, the proof is that the Aadhaar card and you know that the Aadhaar can, can be manufactured and made as many as you want. So we are at a very, very difficult predicament at the moment where we have to actually see whether this donor is actually first time or has she donated earlier too. Because there can be a problem later on. Registry is not in place as yet. When they implement, the implementation of this law is very slow. So that is the reason these problems are coming up, especially with selection of donors. Okay. We can only hope for a speedy implementation and a process in place so yes. that uh, people who are it's planning It's two years future. since the law came in. It was in 22 and we are in 24 and this, there is no registry as yet. So that is what is, that is a big problem for us. I haven't re received my registration as yet. Some of the states are so, you know, they are lagging behind so much. So therefore, but, but then we have applied and they, they, the law says that if you have applied and the government has not sent you back any letter saying that there was a flaw in the registration process, you are you're good to go. You can practice. So we are practicing. Okay. Uh, beyond selecting a donor, uh, what should prospective parents know about the legal and ethical considerations involved in the donor gametes and the ART law. So again, this is why the law came in, you know, the ethics and the medical legal aspect of it. Again, there is a, there is an affidavit which the donor has to sign, her husband also has to sign that they have no claim over this child which will come out of this. And they have really, you know, this is, they are just doing it for the sake of this service. So that of course is there, but uh, uh, despite that, what we are doing, most of us in this practice are doing because now we are allowed to make them meet the donor. So what we tell them is that you please do, we tell this recipient, look, you can see the donor, you can talk to her also, but don't let her go that she is the one, you know, you are going to get her gabit. Mm -hmm. You are the one who, they are very suspicious and very clever too because they've done it many times also. So therefore, you know, they have to be very careful so that the couple doesn't get, the donor doesn't get to know that this is the couple where my eggs are going to go. Because they may blackmail them later on in life, who knows, you know, because the child is genetically hers. So that kind of a thing has always been there, right from the beginning, even when we had unknown donors, that, that kind of a question every couple asks us. 
but then again it is the it is your own uh, how you conduct your center and how you are doing your practice it all depends on your own ethics whether you would want to do something like that or you won't want to but most of us are not doing it we are very fair to the recipient couple the law interestingly is very in it's very uh, you know in favor of the donor and the surrogate but not so much the couple mm. for which it has been made who actually require it you know they try they have and for the doctors as well if i can say so but not so much for the doctors most of our, most of the people who are affected are the ones who are actually suffering from the disease from the problem on that note doctor what would be your advice to couples who are navigating this journey with the new art law what would be your advice how to navigate this whole process you see the if it is a self cycle there is no problem at all they can just approach any i mean any reliable center and they should know the reliability i would say and the credibility of the center and then go through it very important and then uh, for the people who are who are going in for third party reproduction they really have to be aware of this law my advice to all of them is that you know you can be you can be misled in a minute so therefore be very vigilant be very careful of who, which clinic you select which doctor you are going to and see what is there what is the kind of quantum of work that they have in third party also also be very careful of the art bank that is supplying the donor because there there is no the, the, anybody can be an art bank it's not a medico who has to be an art bank anybody can be you can start an art he can start anybody can start an art bank so therefore what is the credibility of the art bank mm. are they actually going to give you a good donor or not all that has to be known to the couple before they come in for taking this third party treat so awareness and awareness. self education awareness. and also doing your own research you are doing law. a very good job sibrit you uh, are educating them <laughs> thank you doctor <laughs> this uh, podcast is meant to uh, help people who are just beginning to start their journey or are in their journey and need some uh, guidance so that they can understand how this uh, process is yeah. planning out for them um on that note uh, also what would be your uh, two cents to tell the doctors who are practicing with the new law what would you like to tell them and also people who are planning their careers in obgyn or infertility some uh, thoughts on that there was that is the first part of the, we didn't talk about it because basically we are talking about we are addressing the patients but then the patients also be have to be aware of the doctor there who is going to treat them mm. the law has divided the doctors into two okay level 1 and level 2 the level 1 are post graduate doctors post graduate again remember not an mbbs post graduate who has no training in infertility as such but she's done her post graduation this person is called a level 1 and she is eligible for starting an infertility practice wherein she can only do up to an iui okay. not an ivf she is not allowed to do an ivf and just basic investigations and treatment of the patient the level 2 consultants are those who have actually had rigorous training in ivf 50 pickups 50 pickups and a 3 years experience in in a good center where they have been uh, taught by a consultant who is actually trained in it so with that segregation now we will have consultants who are actually infertility specialists and the persons who are basically doing general infertility okay so that is what the patient also has to be careful about and that is what the doctors also have to understand and they have to know that if they want to pursue a career in infertility they have to train themselves well mm -hmm. it cannot be just anybody doing anything so that is the message which the government has given us and that is a very important message because that is the only way we can ensure good practice and good ethical practice and transparency and honesty Hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about the criteria of infrastructure and for clinics that are there for the ART? So uh, this would help the listeners to understand if the clinic that they are going to uh, meets the criteria, and this this is what they should be looking out for. So if it is a level one clinic, like I said, that is the basic clinic. There it is only an ultrasound and OPD, and at the most in a small little lab which can actually uh, test them for their semen etc and do a process of called iui which is intrauterine insemination that's all mm -hmm. so they the clinic size will be they will not have a proper lab so the important thing is that in an ivf center they would have the infrastructure to do all kinds of procedures mm -hmm. 
where, where which is not possible in the IO. So that is the first thing that they have to understand that the infrastructure basically is basic over there and it is more intense and complicated in an IVF center. And in an IVF center again, you will have an embryologist who is full time. Mm. Again, there is a criteria for selection of the embryologist, which is not there in, in the level one. And the team is different. You have a team of doctors who are doing ultrasounds for you, who are doing your monitorings and you're prescribing medication for you. Mm. And then there is a team in the lab, which is processing your, your eggs and making embryos out of that. So based on that, so therefore the lab is more, more equipped in an IVF center to do all that. Whereas in an IUS, whereas in a level one clinic, it is not like that. Another thing I would like to inform everybody is about frozen, frozen gametes. Now, again, again, according to the law, the sperm can be frozen in an ART bank. They are allowed, they are supposed to be doing the selection and the storage of gamete, male gamete mm. in the bank. But the female gamete, this, they, they are only allowed to do the selection. The rest of it, the processing is to be done in an ART center, in an ART clinic. Mm -hmm. So the retrieval of egg retrieval for the donor is done in the clinic. And then the eggs are, if there are any left, the government now allows us to freeze them and to be used for the same couple later on. They cannot be used for anybody else, yeah, or they can be given for research. That's what. But the bank is not taking them back. It is to be, it, it is supposed to do that, mm -hmm. but the government has allowed, has has prohibited the transportation of gametes from one place to another. So if I want to take my gametes from Delhi to Calcutta, it's a whole process. Mm -hmm. You have to apply to the government, take permission from the board, and then only you can take it from Delhi or anywhere, wherever you want to. Like I want to shift my embryos from Gurgaon to Delhi. I have to take permission from the government and do it. Mm -hmm. And so both the clinics have to be willing and the government has to give permission and it's central board. So that's a process. So these riders have this, these, these are checks which the government has put over there because what is happening is there was so much of traffic of uh, embryos going out of the country, in the country for sex selection. Mm -hmm. So the government has stopped it, you know. That is what has happened. It, it, there is a cause for all these laws. But who are poor people who are innocent suffer. Doctor, we've spoken at length about how the donor's uh, selection process is. Uh, what, what the criteria is. What about, what has the law stated about the staff and the people that are handling all of this? The doctors, the embryologists or whoever, uh, the infrastructure. What are the criteria set for these people? I think I did speak about the doctors. Mm. They are postgraduates, all of them. Yeah. And in, an, in a level one clinic, she, she, does, she needn't be trained in IVF. She didn't be a fertility specialist, just right. a postgraduate and she can practice in a level one clinic. But if, if she is basically uh, wanting to do infertility, she has to be attached to a level two clinic. Even a level one can be attached to a level two clinic, wherein the level two handles everything for her because she is not allowed to practice IVF, right? Mm -hmm. So that is something that the doctors also have to understand and the patients, because if they are going to a general gynecologist who says, I'm infertility, mm -hmm. she's not an infertility specialist. It has to be a proper IVF center. Mm -hmm. In NOVA, we, this criteria is, is met with in all our centers. We don't take any pe people who are not uh, trained for infertility. Mm -hmm. And then the second major part of it is the embryologists, the lab people, you know, this is, these are the clinicians. Then of course the lab people, the lab people are called embryologists as you know, because they are handling the gametes and then they make embryos. Mm -hmm. So even the lab people have to be fully trained. That is basically the government has given many options. They can be a postgraduate MSc with clinical embryology, or they can be a PhD mm -hmm. or even an MBA, MBBS with a, with a uh, postgraduate degree in clinical embryology. And if they are a graduate, and that also has to be three years in a trained center. Only then they are eligible for practicing embryology in a IVF center, okay. level two, level two center. Yeah. If they are a, if they are just a graduate, they haven't done it, then at least three to five years in an embryology in a center which is handling a large load of uh, uh, embryology work. Mm -hmm. So they have to complete 500 cycles of IVF, 
and 1000 sorry 100 cycles of something called ICSI or intracytoplasmic sperm injection. So these two have to be met and of course now we have so many other things we have biopsies which they do and then we freeze the embryos also so all that has to be they must be fully trained only then will they be employed in an IVF center. So what we are doing at NOVA is our embryologists all across the centers, we have 78 centers now, they are all trained embryologists with the basic qualifications that the government wants. If we have to validate for them for something, for instance, they are trained for ICSI, they are trained for IVF. But suppose we want them to freeze eggs, okay? So we will validate them by giving them surplus eggs or we giving them de uh, defective eggs or something. So they have to freeze them first, at least a hundred of them. And then we validate them for being a, 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 an embryologist who can actually handle the oocyte. Okay. Because nowadays you know that oocyte freezing is a, also a very big thing for cancer and for social egg freezing. Yeah. So they have to handle that kind of a thing. Freezing also, similarly we validate them. So that is a process which NOVA is following. And I'm very proud to say that all our labs are very are fully equipped with such trained people all across. That's very important um, because they're handling such Absolutely. Uh, delicate uh, gametes. Precious. Precious gametes. Uh, what about the other staff, doctor? What about counselors? What about... Uh... Well, yes. You, that's a very important thing that you raised. We actually now the law mandates that every center must have a counselor, whether it is level one or level two. Mm -hmm. Level one actually is, they are not very particular about it, but definitely in a level two. You won't get your license if you don't have a counselor. Especially because it's such a uh, mental yes. journey, uh, mentally taxing journey that a couple has to go through. So do tell us a little bit about the counsellors. Uh, so the counsellors are essentially, uh, uh, they are uh, MSc or even BSc in psychology, trained psychologists. And they act, we, you know, they are, they are actually the backbone of the centre because you are actually talking to them about the clinical perspective of the, of the thing. And then you send them to, uh, say, a finance person who actually talks to them about how much it is going to cost, what, is, what does it entail. But where is, the, where is their stress going mm, to be sorted? That's true. So therefore, in between, we, what we do is we generally send them to a counsellor, either before, you know, the, interestingly, NOVA has a very good system. Our receptionists are also very aware of it. So if they feel that there is a patient who is very stressed already and he is going to ask, going to go through a lot, so they directly send them to the counsellors. And then, you know, they, they go through that whole uh, journey with them or they are their, their questionnaire or whatever it is. And then they are full, they come and tell us, look, doctor, this patient needs extra attention because she's going through a lot of stress. Please be very kind to her. So that's how we generally treat these patients. And the more important thing is what we have found is, which everybody talks about also, is the handholding that they require after the process has been done. Mm. Those 15 days of wait where, the, where they're waiting for the pregnancy test and they have nobody to support them. They've finished with their doctor. So what do they do? They, there is so much of anxiety. That is the time these counselors come in handy and we tell them that you have to keep contact with these patients. So they keep ringing them up and asking them, Tum ko, problem to di hui hai. And you know, if you have any problem with the medication, yeah. anything. So that part is very essential and that is something which tells you about the sensitivity of the program. That's true. If the, if the program is very sensitive to your entire, the entire needs, financial, stress and clinical, everything, mental, mental, then everything. it becomes, yeah. then it becomes a wholesome, wholesome program. Otherwise, you're not looking at different issues. It's, it's very important. Mental health also during this time. I mean, uh, we... Mental health has become a very big thing. It is important. I mean, as, as it should be given and especially during this uh, journey where it's yes. uh, difficult for the couple. It's very important. So it's, I'm, I'm, it's uh, reassuring that the law is in place and that NOVA is doing such a great job at having counsellors at every step. Yeah, it's very yeah, reassuring. I'm quite, uh, I mean, that, that way, yes, we are very, very, uh, very, very pro the law. We are doing everything that is written over there. What about checks and balances? What about who audits this uh, whole process? I mean, that is why the law came in, because there was no auditing. Remember? So again, I'm very proud to say that at NOVA, we are auditing every month. It's the, the government is yet to start the process of auditing mm -hmm. because like I said, there is no registry and there is nothing at, at the moment. But once that comes in place, we will be audited by the government. Okay. We will be we are, like you have, you must be aware of the PCP NDT law, mm -hmm. which actually prohibits the, the, the sex, sex determination. Yeah. So we are already sending our reports to the government every month for PNDT. Mm -hmm. You know, we are supposed to. So we will also be sending the IVF reports every month to the government. So that will be our audit and check. 
बट दैट इज जस्ट अ ब्रीफ ऑडिट की ये आई वी एफ हुआ ये रिजल्ट हुआ दैट इज ऑल दैट इज देयर इज इट बट द फाइल द प्रोसेस वेयर हैव यू मेड अ मिस्टेक वॉट इज डन वेदर इट शुड हैव बीन लाइक दैट और नॉट दैट हैज दैट इज अ प्रॉपर प्रोसेस विच वी हैव सेट इन नोवा and that is why the auditing team is so busy because we are auditing all the time and we are very careful about our quality control so nova has an internal audit Absolutely. team to all the time all, all right. the time that's reassuring on that note thank you so thank much you doctor so it's much. been a pleasure to have you and discuss all of these things it's been revelationary the conversation and the insights that we've been able to mine and i'm sure the listeners are able to take away so much from this conversation to plan their journey and also in time thank, thank you so you much so much simran yeah. you were wonderful thank you for asking those challenging questions to me thank you so <laughs> thank much you for being here probing <laughs> to our listeners we hope this episode has provided you with a clearer understanding of the art law and how it shapes your path to parenthood remember knowledge is power especially on a journey as personal and profound as this For more stories, information, and support, remember to subscribe to our podcast, Fertility Tales, powered by Nova IVF. Until next time, take care. Keep moving forward on your path to parenthood. This is Simrat signing off. See you next time.